what would I say? Whoa now, boy. But what, what you got going on there? What's all this commotion about, son? I'm with the Kim Patrol. I got you breaking the law. W what do you mean, what law? Uh, well, I got you on a 10 6.02 and a 10 23rd. Unauthorized fizzing without a permit. Fizzing without the use of a fume hood. Various other things I can think of. What do you have to say for yourself? What do you mean you're not breaking my laws? What do you mean you got your own laws? Oh, is that so, huh? You got anything else to say for yourself? Reaction laws is own type of law? What kind of mess are you talking about, son? That's it, that's it. I've heard enough. I'm taking you both in. Here, come on, let's go. Oh, oh, now you're the silent type, huh? Oh, okay, well, that's fine. You wanna start talking? You be talking to a judge. No, come on, let's go, let's go. As it happens, yes, reactions do have their own type of law. Now, I want you to notice this graph here on the board. In an ordinary reaction, or in a typical reaction, what we see is, of course, that the reactants decrease over time, but they don't usually decrease at a steady rate. It usually changes. That rate of reaction will change. Likewise, the rate of the products forming will change over time. Since it's not a straight line, it's not a constant rate of reaction throughout the entire reaction. It changes. We can show a relationship between the rate of reaction and the concentrations, and we call that the rate law. It's the way that we can have some consistency even when the rate changes. So a rate law shows the relationship between a rate of reaction and the concentrations of the reactants. It does all depend on the reactants, doesn't it? Because the more reactants, the more products the less reactants, the less products. So how does this all work mathematically? Let's use this generic reaction as an example. We have reactant A and reactant B yielding a product of C. If we were to write a rate law, a very generic rate law, we would write it this way. We'd say that the rate is equal to K times the concentration of A times the concentration of B. I know you're asking, well, what's K? K is what we call the specific rate constant. It is the glue that holds everything together. It's the constant by which we can have this relationship in the rate law. So, even if the rate changes, even if the rate of a reaction changes, the specific constant for that reaction will not, as long as it's at a specific temperature. If you change the temperature, you change the rate, of course. We saw that in the last section. So you would have a different value of K at a different temperature. But as long as we're keeping that reaction at the same temperature, K remains constant. Now sometimes the relationship is very straightforward. If, for example, I double the concentration of A, and in doing so, my reaction rate doubles, that's what we call a first order relationship. In other words, whatever I do to the reactant, it's gonna do the same thing to the rate. But what if it's something other than a first order? What if I double A and the rate quadruples? How do I show that? If it's not a straightforward first order relationship, in other words, I double the reactant and the reaction rate doubles as well, then I may have to use these. These are my reaction orders. You can think of them as powers. Let me give you an example. Let's say that I doubled my concentration of A to begin with, and in doing so, my rate of reaction increases by a factor of four. So let's look at that again. Let's say I double the concentration of A, and my reaction rate turns out to be four times its original rate. So what's the value of M there? Well, I can set it up this way. I can say two to the nth power gives me four. So M is that's right, two. So M equals two here, and what that means is whatever I do to A, the result is going to be that my reaction rate is squared in the process. Get the picture? Now let's practice with a couple of reactions and see if we can write out a rate law. 
These would be good examples for us. For example, how about hydrogen and oxygen yielding water? How would we write the rate law for that? You can pause if you want and see if you can write it out yourself beforehand. And by the way, we just want a generic law at this point. Okay? Go. If you didn't know how to do it, that's okay. That's what examples are for, right? So here's how we do this one. We use only the reactants, right? So I've got my reactant for hydrogen right here and my oxygen right here. The brackets, remember, represent concentration. So my rate law for this reaction, simply put, is the rate is going to be equal to some constant K times the concentration of hydrogen to the nth power times the concentration of oxygen to the nth power. That's it. That's how we write a rate law for that reaction. Let's do one more. Here's another one. This is the reaction of nitrogen monoxide and hydrogen to produce nitrogen gas and water. So let's see if we can write a rate law, a generic rate law for this reaction. If you want to pause before I continue, you can do it now. How'd you do? This is how we do it. The rate is equal to some constant K multiplied by the concentration of nitrogen monoxide to the nth power multiplied by the concentration of hydrogen to the nth power. Now you might notice that we haven't used these coefficients at all. And that's true. The coefficients don't really have any bearing on the rate law. We just use the reactants in this. But you might be asking, well, what about M and N? It doesn't really get me a whole lot to just say M and N the whole time. How do I know what the numbers really are? We can only do that through experimentation. So what I'm going to do next is show you how we do several trials of an experiment and how we can come up with the rate law with those trials. Okay, here we go. The way that it works is like so. What they do is, from one trial to the next, they'll pick one reactant and change it just a little bit. And they'll hold the other one steady. So they'll do this several times and try to have a situation in which they can make comparisons. Like this. Let's take a look at trial one and two. We notice that the nitrogen monoxide is held the same, held the same concentration from one trial to the next but hydrogen is increased by a factor of two. So from one to two, they decided, let's see what effect hydrogen has on this reaction rate. And what happened? Well, from trial one to trial two, nitrogen monoxide, no change, but hydrogen was changed by a factor of two, doubling. What happened to the rate? It also increased by a factor of two. So what's that mean? Well, we can solve for n by saying 2 to the nth power equals 2, right? Doubling here, doubling here. So what's the value of n then? 1, right. So now I know that part of my reaction rate law is this. My order here will be 1. Now, actually, you don't have to write the one if you don't want to. It can be understood, but we'll write it for now just to keep from confusion. Now, let's solve for M. So we're going to find two trials in which hydrogen stays the same, but nitrogen monoxide is changed. Get it? Which two? Two and three, correct? So here, between two and three, Trials two and three, hydrogen is kept the same, the same concentration, so that it's not the one affecting the reaction rate. This time, nitrogen monoxide will be the one affecting the reaction rate. So what happens? Nitrogen monoxide doubles, doesn't it? From here to here, while hydrogen is kept the same. So we're trying to find out what effect nitrogen monoxide has on the reaction rate. Let's see. So, from here to here, it doubled. What about from here to here? 
It's a factor of 4, isn't it? 4 times 4 gives us 16. So, whereas we doubled our concentration of nitrogen monoxide, our rate went up by a factor of 4. You get it? So 2 to the nth power equals 4. What does m equal? Good, 2. So now, look at that. I have my orders. I have everything I need to complete my rate law. So there's one more thing we can do, and that's find the value of k. Now that we have our trials, and now that we know the orders of this reaction, we can solve for k. And then we'll have a complete rate law. So let's do that. All we have to do is pick any one of these three trials. Remember, the value of k for that reaction is constant. Even though the rate changes, the constant does not. So we can use any one of these three trials and use the information in that trial and solve for k, like so. So I've simply used the information from trial one. I just picked that one. I could have picked trial two or trial three. It doesn't matter. So I picked trial one, and I'm going to fill in all the information. So if my rate law equals k times the concentration of NO squared times the concentration of hydrogen to the first, I can rearrange that. And if you want to fill it in and then rearrange, that's fine. It's OK. You can do that. I like to rearrange like so, so I can fill them in, and I don't have to rearrange at the end. But that's just me. So k equals the rate divided by NO squared times hydrogen. So now I just fill in the numbers. 2 times 10 to the negative third for my rate, 0.1 for my concentration of nitrogen monoxide squared, and 0.1 for my concentration of hydrogen. And now I just do the math. So as it turns out, K equals 2. That's it. K equals 2. So no matter what in that reaction, as long as it's held at the same temperature, K is always going to have a value of 2. If the rate changes, doesn't matter. K equals 2. Now for a different reaction, K would have a different value, obviously. But we see how K can be a constant and can hold all these things together in this rate law. One more thing. We can also talk about the reaction order. Not just the order of each reactant, but the whole reaction. In other words, what is the reaction order total? The way we do that is really simple. All we do is we add the exponents together. That's it. So the reaction order for this reaction is, that's right, 3. A reaction order of 3. So again, all you have to do to find the reaction order is to add these exponents together. That's it. Now, I will tell you that the units of k can change depending on the rate order, but that's okay. That's something that we're going to get into next year if you take my college chemistry class. But for now, here's how we find out. If this is molarity per second, rate is in molarity per second, right? And down here we have molarity squared. Get it? And this is molarity here. So, so we can do a little bit of factoring, a little bit of simplification. So this and this will cancel. So we'll have 1 over molarity squared seconds. Weird, I know. But again, it's not something I'm really going to spend a lot of time on right now, maybe later. One last thing. Let's say that I have a reaction, and on one of my reactants, I decide to double the concentration. But in measuring, my rate has absolutely no change at all. What kind of effect did that reactant have on the reaction rate? That's right, zero effect. We call that zeroth order, zeroth order. And what we would do is we would say, well, that's a to the zeroth order. Why is that important? Because anything, anything to the zeroth order 
equals 1. So in other words, in the rate law, that would cancel out. Now, I will tell you, I don't know if 0 to the 0th order equals 1, but I bet you can YouTube that and find out. Okay, here's your problem for the day. What I want you to do is, using this generic equation, reactant A plus reactant B yields products, what is the rate law? And I want you to use these trials to determine what the orders will be for each one. So write the rate law, complete with the orders, and that's your assignment. Well, guys, we learned quite a bit today. We learned about rate laws, obviously. We showed how the relationship can be found between the concentration of the reactants and the rate of reaction. We also showed how we can write a generic rate law for a reaction. Then we talked about orders, the orders of the reactants, and how we can determine those experimentally. We also said that reaction order is simply combining the orders of the reactants together, adding those exponents together. We also talked about zeroth order and how if something doesn't change the reaction rate at all, it has a zero effect. Zeroth order cancels out. But most of all, we talked about the specific rate constant, how amazingly it holds everything together in this rate law and makes it what it is. I hope this has been helpful to you. If I can do anything for you, if I can answer any questions, don't hesitate to email me. Help each other out too. That's legal, you can do that. So help each other out. If you need anything, let me know. Until the next time, God bless.